shifting and changing eligibility of the COVID-19 vaccine for Connecticut residents. We are so very fortunate to have an expert panel from Governor Lamont's COVID-19 vaccine advisory group with us tonight to update and address some of the questions that many of us have. Um, our format will be to introduce the expert panelists. And because of the large number of questions that, that we've gotten already, we're going to go directly to my Fairfield General Assembly state representatives and then go to the Fairfield town leaders uh, to talk and, and feel and ask these questions of our panelists. So let's get started. Um, the COVID vaccine advisory panelists are, we have uh, Dr. James Hadler, MD, MPH, who's a clinical professor uh, at the U Yale University School of Medicine. And, and I believe uh, in the emerging infection section. Um, so it, it's very timely and his expertise is gonna be incredibly valuable. We have uh, Dr. Boissonneau, um, who is a otolaryngologist, which is an ENT doctor, but his personal perspective is he got COVID and also has taken the two-dose vaccine. So he can offer some of the medical basis, but also personal experience as well. We have Senator Heather Summers, uh, my co-ranking uh, Senate Minority Leader on the Public Health Committee, but is also uh, on the Advisory Committee on Communications. So thank you for uh, getting everybody together. I wanna to thank Senator Summers for fielding this panelist of people. Um, so I'm very grateful. So let me go right into introducing my fellow state representatives uh, and they can introduce themselves and go right to the question of the panel because we've got a lot of questions and we wanna make sure that our experts are, are here to, to answer um, the, the questions that so many people have had. So Representative Laura Devlin, please. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, and thank you for uh, everyone who's part of this panel. There have been so many questions and we so appreciate the work that you are doing, um, but I've received multiple questions. So I, I wanna take the opportunity to put two towards you. One of them is probably more communications related. The other is more scientific related. So um, let me start on the scientific side and I'm gonna throw them both out at the same time. Uh, from a scientific perspective, what I've heard from some constituents who are type one diabetes uh, individuals or individuals who suffer or have type one diabetes that they have dealt with all of their lives and are very confused and concerned about why they are not part of the group within 1B, while there are some uh, categories within 1B that you could say um, individuals could take steps on their own to mitigate their issues, uh, but obviously if you have type one diabetes, that's not the case. So that's one. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna put out the other one too. There seems to be a tremendous amount of confusion about who is eligible, but mostly how you find out if you are eligible. So right now we know type, or in a 1B, uh, 75 plus individuals in age are eligible. If you could clarify how they are notified and for those individuals, and if they have to take any action to be, um, uh, to sign up for a vaccine. And for those individuals who aren't quite there yet, maybe they're 66, 67, are they supposed to, are they gonna be notified in some way they should take action? If they are currently employed, is it their employer? So every employer in the state of Connecticut will up, upload rosters or did, you know who needs to take action and how do they find out what they need to do? So one is related to type one diabetes. The other is how do people know what to do and where do they get clear direction? Dr. Hadler, Dr. Bosano, uh, please feel free. Okay, I, 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 can't, I can't speak totally to clear direction and maybe Dr. Kwasano can. So I'm 74, so I'm also waiting for this uh, 65 to 74 year old age group to kick in. My understanding uh, of uh, the priorities that have been set up, so there was one A, which was very clear. There's one B now, which uh, doesn't, which I think does include people with type, you know, who are 16 to 64 with type one diabetes. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of groups within them and it, it comprises uh, about a third of all the adults 
in the state, if not more. Uh, and so instead of having chaos and trying to have 1 million people trying to sign up for appointments at once, the uh, the group that's decided, which I'm not officially part of, but is deciding the priorities within this group, they've basically decided to, well, first of all, start with 75 and older, because that group contributes the most per capita to hospitalization and to death. And the idea is to try to lessen the load on the hospitals and lower the number of, of uh, tragic death consequences of uh, COVID uh, disease. The, uh, the second round, they've now decided, as I think uh, Governor Lamont stated last night, they've decided that the next group will be the 65 to 74 year old age group in favor of sort of people who have, uh, as part of their jobs, they, they directly face other people and uh, like teachers and grocery store workers and things like that. Uh, uh, and uh, somewhere along, somewhere in that group still to be determined when their turn comes up is are those with type one diabetes who are older than 16 uh, and younger than 64. But the choice of the 65 to 74 year old group that Governor Lamont stated last night was similar to why they went with the oldest group first. This is sort of the next most age related vulnerable group. It doesn't make up that much of the population, but it does make up uh, a, a, high, a much higher percentage of all the hospitalizations and all the deaths. So I think the goal at the moment is to sort of protect the people who are most vulnerable. Obviously they're leaving out some, in the sense of those with underlying conditions who are younger than 65, but just, but just taking age, since age is first such a high predictor of uh, bad consequences uh, and putting them next. I understand that, I'm, that probably I'll be able to try to sign up in a couple of weeks when they get pretty close to the end of the 75 to the 75 and older group. Uh, in terms of signing up, uh, maybe others, I think others can say more. My understanding, though, is that uh, I, for example, am not connected with a direct health plan. Actually, I worked for the state of Connecticut for many years, and I'm on Medicare now and have some long-term insurance from the state of Connecticut. I worked as the chief of infectious diseases for the state health department for 25 years, but that was the last 12 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, If I may, uh, Jim, if I may it, ask uh, uh, David to offer some perspective, I sure. think one of the questions that that Representative Devlin wanted to key in on is the fact that that I have also heard that that certain people with type two have actually been uh, eligible ahead of type one. So maybe you can shed some some medical context onto that as well. Uh, I think Representative Devlin, would that be correct? That uh, to, right to the point that why would type two jump ahead of type one uh, diabetics? Senator, in fact, what I've heard is that um, type 1 isn't on the list at all of underlying conditions, but type 2 is, smokers are. Um, so for those individuals that, you know, are deeply concerned about other compromising conditions they may have, um, yeah, that is the question. Thank you. Dr. Bosano? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm here to learn as well as to provide any insight. So I'm learning, this is the first I'm learning uh, of the differences between a type 1 and type A uh, diabetics as far as how they're grouped. I was not aware of those particular um, um, disease processes being stratified that way. So I can't really help you answer that question scientifically because this is first I'm hearing about it as well. But um, I'm glad to hear about it, um, and I'd like to dig more into it myself. Um, um, I can, all I can say is, is that there, I can go ahead. That question. Oh, you. thanks, Heather. So um, the CDC has a guideline for the uh, diseases that would be considered a comorbidity um, under the type uh, 1B. Type 2 diabetes has been um, shown to run with it. What that comes with it is obesity. And they have been shown to be four times as likely to die from COVID than someone who is type 1 diabetes. And that's why they are included in the list. And this I was just going to postulate that that's probably the case. That's interesting. Thank you. That's very helpful. So let me go to uh, uh, Representative Kristen mccarthy Vehi. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you for being here, Kristen. Oh, well, it's so wonderful to be here. And I know that there are a lot of questions of the vaccine uh, about the vaccine, and I have uh, just a couple. I'll follow up actually on um, one of the ones that Rep. Devlin added, but I'll 
do a quick public service announcement to remind everyone that the vaccine is not the be all and end all right now. Please make sure you continue to wear your masks, wash your hands, keep your distance. And I know that uh, Senator Summers, it's great to see you. Our doctors, uh, our first select woman and Sands Cleary. Sands is our local superhero. Um, my question is, and I'd love for Sands if you could answer this, which similar to Rep Devlin, with the signups, I'll share both of my questions, but to follow up on that sign up question, how do people sign up and get access and know which pathway to follow, which is really, you know, to support her question. And then the second one, which came from a constituent today who reached out was with respect to the, what we're hearing about some of the allergic responses. And I even had this in a chat with my family today on Facebook, some questions about and we heard a little bit about this earlier today. I think uh, Rep. Leeper and I were on a call, a batch of vaccine, and, and how does that work? Are there concerns about allergic responses, and what are you seeing, and what can you tell us? So I guess the first one really would be to SANS related to that sign-up piece, and then the second one maybe to the doctors. Sure. So I can start with that. So uh, the the process to sign up is is every day evolving. So So initially, you know, because because it was so targeted at specific individuals, you went through your employer. Um, the when they switched and added the one B seventy five and older, uh, the state and and some local health departments uh, put up um, registration forms uh, to allow those people to get into the system called VAMS, Vaccine Administration Management System, uh, and that's the system that many people are using outside of the large healthcare systems. They're using their own systems, but the health departments and others are using this uh, system called VAMS. Uh, so to enable people to get into VAMS, you have to get uploaded in some way. And so currently, you can go to the state uh, webpage um, and enter your information there, click how you, how you are qualified, and then the state will upload that group when you are qualified. So, so they're uploading individuals all the time. We had a similar form for those, you know, if you're one, one A or one B 75 and older, we would upload you. We uploaded over 10,000 people last week into VAMS and that gets them in the system and then they can see all the clinics that are around. So that's, that, that's kind of how it was last week. And now what's happening uh, each day, uh, large healthcare systems like Harvard Healthcare and uh, Yale are adding clinic sites. And so, for example, if you if you go on to uh, my chart uh, right now, you can find you know more than a dozen clinics in Fairfield and other communities around that are offering COVID vaccinations. So, if you are part of the Yellow Haven Health System, uh, having a doctor affiliated with that, you can go into your my chart right now and uh, click as an individual and sign up for a COVID vaccine if you are eligible. Uh, and Harvard Healthcare has a similar system, and they're they're taking uh, um, uh, individuals at St. V's right now, and they're working on setting up other facilities. So each day, you're going to see additional facilities rolling out, more opportunities uh, to be vaccinated uh, for everybody who's eligible. And in addition, we're working on systems. There's currently a system for those who don't have the tech. Uh, savviness to get in. There's a system that you can simply call the state and they will take down your information and get you into a clinic uh, that is taking, uh, it's like a closed clinic that takes those those individuals uh, and, and those opportunities are going to expand as well very soon. There'll be more and more clinics like that. Sans, just if I may, Laura had asked, and Laura, maybe you were about to ask this to follow up, how do people know when they're eligible. That was the other thing that I heard Laura ask a yeah. one, and I thought it was a good question. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Laura. No, if I could just add on to that too, Sans, are you, so if you could clarify, do people need to go to the centralized VAMS, you know, system to sign up the state, you know, portal, or do they go to their health provider? So if you could clarify yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Well. Sure. So, so I'll answer the first question about eligibility. How do you find out about it? So you go to the state immunizations program, just, just put in the, you know, state of Connecticut COVID eligibility and the, 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 the website will pop up and that lists who's eligible now. And that's, that's who I go to, you know, I look up that website every day to make sure, you know, things haven't changed, uh, you know, uh, and so that's the site where you're getting that information. It'll be once once there's a change. I mean, it'll be in the media. It'll be all over the place. Uh, but the state uh, Department of Public Health 
website is where you're going to find that eligibility information. Um, and then the uh, in terms of how do people sign up like now that the question is, you know, is it essentially if you are part of right now a, a, a Hartford Healthcare affiliated uh, system, you can go to their site. You if you're part of a, a Yale affiliated uh, system doctor, you can uh, go to go to the MyChart Plus and log in. I did it just tonight just to see what it looked like. Um, and because because it's you know this is new stuff evolving, um, and so you go to there, or you don't have to get into the VAM system. You can go into those two systems to to uh, to sign up to be vaccinated if you're eligible, um, and and then it, the the other one to get into VAMS, so you go to that same state website, and there's a there's a large button there. You can go to our website. There's a button on there how to sign up, and that'll get you into the VAM system. And but that's that's just basically that sends you a, like a, a key to get in. Then you enter your username and password and fill out all the forms, and then you go in and pick out a clinic. Now a lot of those clinics are full right now. Uh, so it's it's not guaranteeing you're going to get a clinic spot. You may have to broaden your search to like you know 50 miles or 100 miles or enter a zip code up of New Haven or New Hartford to find an available clinic because right now that's this 75 and older population is so large that they're snatching up all available slots. And so uh, you know it is a challenge to get it. But if you if you kind of put your feelers out to the three different ways to get in, you know people are finding spots you know we have we we have people are, are that sit there and refresh and refresh and refresh and then they find cancellations and they get into our clinics uh you know they're sitting outside in their cars waiting and refreshing their screens so um you can get in there are you know, there are a lot of cancellations because people switch and find a better date an earlier date and they cancel their appointment so i'll leave it at that if i could add to that i think it's important that um people also recognize that you can also make an appointment if you call 211 uh, the state has now um, worked with 211. We have a new system up called the Vaccination Appointment Assistant Line. And for example, uh, they will take your information if you're someone who does not have access to a computer. And every appointment has been used. Monday, they are only at 70% capacity. So there is still availability to make an appointment on Monday. Um, we are continuing to roll out through the health districts uh, like you have here. Um, we are looking to do drive-in vaccinations at some point in time. You will be hearing about those popping up um, across the state. But the limiting factor right now is the amount of vaccine that we have uh, in, in our hands. Um, Connecticut has done a great job in getting vaccines into people's arms. We have vaccinated over 280,000 people in the state of Connecticut. 32,000 people have had both of their shots, but we are limited in the amount of supply that we are getting. Um, do not call your primary care provider to get the shot. They don't have the shot. They are overwhelmed with calls. This particular vaccine requires specific storage capabilities and doctor's offices do not have that storage capability. So um, as you heard from Mr. Cleary, contact your local health district. Hartford Healthcare, Yale is very easy to use. You can go on their website and sign on. They have a big button that says, if you're 75 and older, press here. You can call 211 and they will walk you through the system. So there are multiple ways and there will continue to be multiple ways to get the vaccine and sign up. Um, if through either through your employer, if you're somebody who is employed, um, probably 75 and above, we're hoping that you're retired and that you will um, don't have to rely on your employer to register you. Um, but as we get more vaccine, we will open up more points where you will be able to um, accept the vaccine and, and get vaccinated. So I want to make sure that's clear. And what we'll do is we will provide uh, Senator Wong and all of the reps the contact information the numbers. You can also call Hartford Healthcare. You can call Yale University and uh, their healthcare system so that you will have direct access to how to get into the system to make an appointment. Thank you very much, Heather. And, and uh, uh, Kristen, do you have any additional follow-up? If not, I'll go right to uh, Jen Leeper. And I noticed that uh, First Select Woman Kupchak has joined us after Representative Leeper. We'll go to her and, and get her question and, and thoughts and introduction as well so before and senator wong the other question was about the allergies and allergic right, right correct thank you thank you thank you for that oh, i can address that uh briefly if you'd like um i think it's important to point out that there's a significant difference between a true allergy versus the expected response that one would get from receiving a vaccine um 
feeling uh, achy or pain or these other various um, symptoms that you can have after a vaccine is not an indication of an allergy. An allergy is a very specific hypersensitive anaphylactic reaction that that you might need to carry an EpiPen around for. You know, things like penicillin allergies are, are good uh, or allergy to bee sting. Um, there are cases that people can have an anaphylactic reaction to just about anything. So most vaccine uh, sites and administrators will ask very important questions. And you'll see that when you register, if you go through that FAM system, do you have an, an have you had an anaphylactic allergy to any kind of medication? Um, if so, you can still receive the vaccine, but you are observed for a 15 to 30 minute period of time. Um, as it stands now, when I got my vaccines, I was observed for 15 minutes, wasn't allowed to leave the vaccinated area, even though I've not had an allergic reaction in the past to uh, any medication. So we are really erring on the side of safety. It's extremely rare to have a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction to this vaccine, but there are people out there that could have that. That's to be um, um, compared to an expected reaction to receiving a vaccine. And there's various symptoms that we can go over if we have time or if we want to, because uh, I went through them myself when I received both doses of vaccine. That's not a sign of having a bad reaction to the vaccine. That's an appropriate reaction to the vaccine. Well, I can I, I can just add that the anaphyla that, that uh, the types of reaction that are the true allergic reactions are treatable. And so that's why you're kept there for 15 minutes to make sure, sometimes longer, just to make sure you're not having such a reaction because it's harder to treat if you're not there. <laughs> Thank you for both of those answers. Thank you. Jennifer? Thanks, Senator Wong. Um, thank you all for being here. I know so many people are very grateful to have an opportunity to have some questions answered. There are many people anxious for this vaccine. And like Senator Summer said, there's just not quite enough supply yet. Um, and also, Senator Summers, thank you for mentioning 211 as a new resource to call. I've had several constituents who are um, not comfortable using the computer or don't have emails, and they've had a hard time getting through to somebody. So that's a great resource for them. Thank you. And uh, thank you also, Representative McCarthy Vahey. I am one of those people who has anaphylaxis. So I am happy to hear we are all good to go. We just have to be observed for 30 minutes. Um, I have two questions. One is how actually that observation period could complicate the rollout uh, for drive-through vaccination centers. And then secondly, just kind of wondering for some thoughts on the ground, and maybe Sands, this is a question for you. I've heard that approximately 1.8 million people are included in phase 1B. That's, that's a lot of folks. And what has sort of happened is we've just collapsed, this is my perception anyway, a lot of phases into 1B. And when we get to some of the criteria, like um, high risk conditions and being a smoker, how are how are people on the ground and nurses administering this vaccine supposed to confirm some of these? We're, we're putting a lot of pressure on, on our medical uh, frontline service providers to be um, the arbiters here and, and make some challenging decisions or not. And then it's going to a little bit become a free for all. Are people going to say they're smokers so they can get a vaccine and, and jump the line. Uh, I don't know, but that was a question I also had received today. I think I can answer that as far as the drive-through clinics. Um, many of our health districts have, they're trained in pandemics and they have systems and plans in place for a drive-through clinic where you would drive th through, get your vaccine, and then your car goes into another lot lane where you have um, observers that go from car to car to car to make sure during that 15 minute period um, everything is okay. If there's an issue, you blow on your horn. Um, so they have it down to a science. Um, as far as the criteria for 1B, um, the, the criteria really is um, 16 to 64 with one comorbidity listed on the CDC website and potential imminent death. So it's not one, it's that and death. So to a 20 year old smoker would not be at the um, you know, would not be indicated to go and get the um, shot versus somebody who was, let's say, 50 and had COPD, et cetera. So um, that is going to be difficult. We are going to rely on our medical community, again, putting more 
uh, pressure on them. You know, typically when you get your physical, it asks you, are you, are, are you a smoker? Yes or no. Um, we have not gotten clarification on exactly those um, comorbidities are going to be reviewed to be able to access um, to get the vaccine. I do think that you're going to see right now at 75 and above. I think the next uh, tier will be 65 and above. I'm not sure what the next criteria, if they were going to go through and, and call out the essential workers by job category, that has not been decided yet. Our, our committee has a meeting with the allocation committee next week. Many other states have actually listed the occupation and said, if you are this, this, and this, you can now go and get your vaccine. That is still to be determined, partly because we are, again, limited by the allocation we're getting from the federal government. We have heard today that the president is going to open up um, many more vaccines uh, to the states. So that could change things and, and the time could be compressed. We also have two new vaccines that are close to getting EUA through FDA. And if they become available online, the whole time frame will be condensed. And one of those vaccines is something that doctors can have in their office. So. We are asking for people to be patient and we're gonna be persistent because this is all happening in real time. And as um, Dr. Boisano and I'm sure Mr. Cleary and Dr. Hadler can say, we have not had a pandemic in a hundred years. This is, we're learning and evolving every day as we go. Thank you, Heather. And I, I just wanna follow up, Jen, you bring up a very good point that, you know, opening up to age 65 into 1B adds over a million people into that category. And, and I think one of the most important things we want to get out of this meeting to the audience is giving them a sense of, of, of expectation, managing expectation, right? It, it, and, and so one of, the, one of the powerful reasons of having the, the, the advisory panel is, so could you give us some insight in the audience as to, so somebody 65 to 74, when could they be expected to get the vaccine? if we haven't finished up with, with the 75 and older and our first responders. I got many people who've called and said, look, the governor told me that 65 belongs in 1B and we're going into 1B. People, that creates anxiety, that creates a, a frustration. Uh, so through the panel, if I may, um, where do 65 to 74 sit? And, and where do they go from the expectation? Are they looking to manage their expectations and not have the shot till March or April? If that is indeed the case, I, I think it'd be important for people to know and manage that. And any insight from the panel? Well, that is not the case. We, we are hoping to be through the 75 year olds in the next uh, few weeks and then be able to open up um, the, to the 65 year olds. We're hoping by mid-February, we will start to be able to start inoculate the 65 year olds. That is the plan based on the trajectory. Um, last week, we received additional vaccine from the federal government because we have done such a good job of getting the vaccine we have in people's arms. So we're looking um, to hopefully be through 1B, the entire population, which is 1.3 million people, we're looking to try to be through the, that entire group by May. Now that is based on the production of vaccine that we're going to be um, getting. But again, people have to be patient. They have to um, be persistent in looking at the information that changes almost on a daily basis sometime. But we wanna get through the 75 year olds um, quickly. Uh, and the reason why 65 is next is because most of the deaths, 89% of the deaths are 65 and older. Those are the most vulnerable people. And that's why we want to um, inoculate them next. I hope that well, answers you. I, I appreciate that kind of a timeline. I think that's helpful for all of us to be able to share with our constituency. And, and that is good news. So uh, uh, Jennifer, any follow-up additional questions? No, thank you. That was all very helpful. And I am so hopeful for these drive-in clinics as hopefully we get ramped up um, supply that that we can be turning our vaccinations into as efficient a process as our testing sites have become. So thank you for all that information. Thank you. And, and I want to introduce the Fairfield's first select woman, uh, Brenda Kupchak, former state representative as well. Um, if you could articulate from a municipal perspective, um, the challenge you have and the great work of Sands Clary 
uh, Brenda, but also kind of if you have any question for the panel uh, based upon your role as a town leader. So welcome. So <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, so yes, um, you know, obviously this has been a difficult year for all of us, everybody in Connecticut, all across our country and across the globe. And we're all just doing our level best uh, to stand up and do what we need to do. And when the vaccines came out, obviously that has been a welcome and a light at the end of tunnel, so to speak. Our health department, and as I imagine, um, public health, state department of public health officials are, are aware of the strain that has been put upon local health departments. And frankly, um, I'm, I'm just every day just amazed at the work that Fairfield's health department does under the leadership of Sans Clarion. I mean, this man, I don't even think he sleeps, frankly, and he works just so incredibly hard. And there's so many people calling and emailing, especially now with all the confusion about the rollout who is supposed to be on it? Who isn't on it? When can you sign up? Having difficulties with signing on to the federal van system. It's been it's been daunting, frankly. And so um, what I would say is that I want I hope our uh, public is is tries to be patient, because obviously what we have seen in, in Fairfield is that, you know, the state sends different information nearly almost every day. And it's really difficult for um, towns like ours to be able to pivot and try to react to those quick changing uh, decisions. And so when they see the CDC, for example, um, was going to allow 65 and up, but they didn't give all the details or maybe someone didn't actually hear all the details. And then the town hall gets flooded with calls from everyone 65 saying, I want to sign up, I can't sign up, and they don't understand why they can't. So it would be incredibly helpful if the directives coming from the state were crystal clear and so that each town, you know, could have that information because it's it's too difficult. And everybody, you know, I kind of, I joked about this a little bit in the office. It's like, you know, there's not enough rafts on the Titanic. You know, everyone wants that raft. And I understand that frustration. But at the same time, we are under the rules of the state. So people say, well, why can't I sign up? You know, um, other states they saw in the news are allowing this age group or that one to do it. So it becomes a bit confusing for the average everyday citizen. So if it, it would be extraordinarily helpful if the State Department of Health was much more clear in their uh, information going out and saying this is Connecticut and here's what you are, and here's what you can do, because that would minimize the amount of um, inquiries into our health department's office, who's doing so much important work, and then has to now, you know, have 50 to 100 to 200 voicemails a day, and literally residents are calling the register's office, they're calling my office, they're calling any department they can to try to get information, so I think even it would be helpful to have um, information uh, banks open for the public where they could call and get these questions answered or even walk through. We are going to be setting up a call center in the basement of town hall with CERT volunteers to be able to just answer basic questions for people because the phones are just ringing off the hook. So that is one of the challenges we're facing. And so in my opinion, our public health department needs to do what they're supposed to do, what they're trained to do. Um, contact tracing, uh, answering questions, obviously monitoring businesses and, and all of that alike, but also the vaccines now. So obviously these are big issues and more vaccines would be great and more training and more uh, resources to allow each community to be able to uh, provide as many vaccines to as many people in each group as soon as possible because people want the vaccine. So we can get them and we can get the resources to man and, and be able to provide those vaccines, that would be extraordinarily helpful. And I'm sure I'm not alone as a, a municipal official. I'm sure every municipal official in the state feels the same way. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, First Select Woman. Uh, do you have any particular questions for the panel experts? Now we just want more vaccines <laughs> and resources. I'm sorry. <laughs> you That's know, okay. this video. Um, I, I mean, I live this with Sans Clary every day. You know, I he is extraordinarily um, smart and, and he has so much information and he 
shares it with me uh, every single day. It's just we, we need resources, we need more vaccine, and we need people to help us um, deliver it. Thank you. And and um, we, we have uh, some additional questions that I'd like to be able to, to follow up. And uh, one of the questions that came up was, uh, for our medical experts, um, what do you know about the latest variant uh, that is deemed to be much more infectious? Uh, and so the, the part two of that question is, will the current vaccine be uh, um, a effective against that? And can you explain a little bit in medical terms uh, what that variant is? Okay, I can I can uh, give it a try. There's actually more than one variant. Important to point out. You've heard of this B117, the one that was found in England. Uh, what we know about it, or why we think it's one of the main reasons people thought it was potentially more infectious than others, and since then, laboratory and other uh, strains that existed before that was identified, is that it went from being sort of a minuscule fraction of all the different uh, strains that have been typed, and not all strains get typed because that's another process, but of all the strains that have been typed, went from minuscule percentage up to like 60% of all the strains that were being typed in England uh, that were selected sort of randomly. Uh, and so that, you know, so something made this strain have, a, have an advantage over others. Uh, otherwise, it should just remain a minuscule portion if it was sort of equal in terms of its ability to transmit. What it, what appears to have happened is this something that I think everybody's familiar with the term spike protein, which is this protein that's on the surface of uh, the virus that is sort of like the key that gets into the lock uh, on a cell. It's kind of like putting a, seat, a, a key in, into a lock and opening it, uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that it developed a number of mutations that made actually it fit the lock a lot better. <laughs> uh, and it and for every, uh, and, and it turns out that it, it's a, probably about half again more, one to two times more infectious than uh, the regular one. So, for example, I had I, I had COVID and I was in a group of ten people, and we uh, were in a situation where transmission was possible. We were eating, taking off our masks some of the time, or even uh, uh, things like that. If I had one of the strains that preceded it, maybe two people would become infected. But in, but if I had that strain, three or four people would become infected uh, because it tends to, it fits the lock better and it opens the cell and is able to get in better than pre-existing strains. It turns out based on laboratory experiments that it doesn't appear to be, uh, it, it appears to be uh, uh, not, it doesn't cause more severe disease, number one. Uh, and number two, uh, it's uh, uh, even though it's more infectious, it, well, well, it's uh, it's the antibodies that you form and that the vaccine causes your body to produce are just as effective against it as they are against any of the other strains. Important to point out that, however, that so that this is the B one one seven that we've heard about, but there's a strain that's been identified in South Africa that's done similar things and that also has similar mutations. There's one in Brazil. Looks like there may be one in Southern California. We've had so much transmission in the United States that as this virus keeps on producing imperfect copies of itself, the more transmission there is, the more sort of imperfect copies and changing copies that we're going to see. And uh, we may have one of those strains in the United States that, that's homegrown. We're just beginning to figure that out now. Dr. Handler, will the vaccine, the current existing vaccine, be effective against this new strain? Uh, it, it's definitely effective against the first one of these new strains that we've identified. And I think experiments are going on to take a look at the others. But so far, it looks like the antibodies that are produced from the vaccine are broad enough that they cover all so far all the slight changes in this spike protein. So the antibodies are basically going to, uh, if they see the virus and they see the spike protein, they're going to cover it up and they're going to keep it from being able to enter cells. Uh, and the antibodies that are produced from the vaccine so far are just as good at covering up and blocking that spike protein from getting into cells. Thank you, uh, 
Dr. Handler. Um, David, if you could, um, why should people, I mean, from the standpoint, um, is, is the vaccine, uh, you got COVID and you still got the vaccine. Now, I, I thought about it in thinking that you had probably developed an immunity for it and you still got the vaccine. Can, can you explain some of the rationale of, of the vaccine? Yeah. That, that possibly people still could get COVID even if they vaccinate and that they have to follow the protocol of masks, hygiene, uh, social distancing. W would it be fair to say that? I mean, you've had that. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my particular situation, I tested positive on a random test. I, I wasn't having any symptoms, but uh, in my high risk profession, I'm, I'm frequently exposed to patients with COVID. So I decided one day to go get tested without symptoms and I turned up surprisingly positive. And fortunately, I didn't have any symptoms, which leads me to believe that I probably didn't have a very strong immune response to when I received the virus. I was not sick from it. Being sick when you're exposed to a virus is a pretty good indication that your, your immune system is reacting to the presence of the virus. So there's that. There's the other important consideration is that this particular uh, virus can have an up to a 14 day incubation period. So you could be exposed on day one, not know it, get the vaccine a week later, and all of a sudden, um, symptoms of COVID can show up because you're still within that 14 day period. So there was no guarantees that I wasn't already, uh, wasn't gonna eventually get sick from an exposure, even if I've gotten the first vaccine. Now, after I got the second vaccine, which was now two weeks ago, um, statistically, and according to all the data that we know from the two trial to two trials so far, is after about a week of from getting your second dose, you've reached maximum immunity that you can expect out of the vaccine, which is an amazing 95% chance, which is the highest, um, and um, Dr. Hedler could probably talk to this, the highest um, level of protection that any modern vaccine has been able to accomplish. But that still gives um, a little bit of a 5% chance maybe that there's a possibility, depending on your own personal immune system, that you could still get infected. But the another question that we haven't answered yet and might take some time to answer is if a person is vaccinated and they can't get infected or are unlikely to get infected, but can they get somebody else infected by just virus that happens to be hanging around in their mouth or their nose? We haven't answered that question yet. We know biologically that that's l less likely. Um, most of the time when people uh, are exposed to a virus and they get sick and they develop a fever, that's a good indication that you are spreading the virus out of your body. That's um, that a, a patient develops a fever and symptoms when a virus is actively replicating and turning over in the body and invading your body. So that's what's most infectious to other people. I never had a fever. I never had a cough. I probably was not very infectious to other people. In fact, um, my closest contacts all tested negative twice during my, my two week um, quarantine period. But we don't know the answer to that question yet. So it's not wise to let down our guard at all yet. I, I don't feel comfortable not wearing a mask yet. And I don't expect to feel comfortable not wearing a mask yet until we get much more solid data, which will take a long time. Uh, you know, this, it, it hasn't even been a year yet, which is still amazing to me that we're at the point where we actually have a vaccine um, within a year. We're basically building this airplane as we're flying it. Uh, the uh, COVID didn't show up on our shores with an instruction sheet on how to defeat it. So we're trying to figure it out um, as we go. And I just wanted to um, just say one thing um, I, I like Dr. Hedler's explanation of, of how the spike protein works. And I just want to, to say how, how I explain it to my patients. Um, I, I tell my patients, and everybody's familiar now with the picture of what COVID looks like, um, the, the big red ball with all the red spikes coming out of it. I explain to my patients that those red spikes are Velcro. And it's designed to stick. Velcro wants to stick. So the the, the more Velcro you have, or the more complex Velcro you have on your virus, the easier it becomes to stick to the cell so it can invade the cell. So when you hear about mutations and variances, the, those red spike proteins, the Velcro is changing such that it can stick better to the cell. Fortunately, we are finding out that 
people with the different uh, variations aren't any more sick when they get when they get it. They just get it easier. The Velcro works better. And I've been reassured by some Pfizer scientists. I, I know a few of them that the um, antibody that is being produced against the original spike protein, the initial strain that they did all the research on, is robust enough, has enough activity to handle the subtle changes that are occurring now in the spike protein as it stands now. That being said, it's in everybody's best interest to get this, vax, this virus out of circulation as soon as possible because the longer a virus lives in a community worldwide in a pandemic, the more chances you're going to get to make changes to the virus. Um, so to me, that's the number one reason to get vaccinated is to get this virus out of circulation. Interesting point to use the uh, description of the Velcro and, and how the possibility of certain groups having a higher comorbidity consideration. And that's where the medical facts is important. Uh, Senator Summers, a any additional thoughts on, on, those partic on these particular questions on the vaccine? No, I think that um, one question that comes up that I, I think is important to um, put out there, there's a few questions that um, have been posed that um, we have the answer to, but I'd love to have the clinicians actually answer this, which is, there's a few. Um, is this safe for women of childbearing age? That's the first one. There's some misinformation about not being able to donate blood if you have uh, received the vaccine. And um, the last one is, I think you touched, even if you get the first uh, dose, you're still have a chance of contracting the virus. And, and many people say, well, why should I get it then? And, and, and the real reason that we've been saying is because your symptoms could be a lot less. Um, you're not gonna end up on a ventilator. So I think those are things that I would love for you all to touch base on because those come up repeatedly. Um, and um, safety and efficacy, there is this sometimes misconception that the term that was uh, coined in Washington Warp speed means that there was safety and efficacy that was skirted, which was not. It was the time for the FDA to review the documents. So if you all could touch base on that, um, that would be great. There's a lot of uh, false information, you know, the blood donation, the childbearing years that I think we need to get cleared up. Um, so Dr. Boisnow and Dr. Hadler, you guys would be the experts on that. <laughs> uh, Why don't we sort of alternate? You take one and then I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, well, let me, can I talk about the blood donation because I'm actually going to be doing that next week. Um, I, I signed up for um, a Red Cross blood drive in Mystic, Connecticut for next week. Um, um, and they explicitly state on their website that if you've received either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, you can donate blood. Um, that, that's not a contraindication of donating blood. They also state that your particular blood if, it's, if you've had the vaccine, is not yet um, um, being used as convalescent plasma, so it's not necessarily being directly given to very, very ill COVID patients, um, whereas convalescent plasma derived from people who have had a severe COVID infection is being given to other folks with COVID infections. So, yes, you can donate blood. There's a um, a very large need for blood, um, especially during a pandemic. Um, one thing that maybe people don't realize is critically ill patients from COVID who have system failures throughout the body also fail to make the proper amount of blood. Um, so um, their blood counts can drop very low and they still need blood. So my hope is my blood that I donate next week, I've had COVID, so I might've had some antibodies produced from my COVID infection, um, but I also was receiving the vaccine, so I, I will have antibodies derived from that spike protein vaccine that uh, we just discussed. So my hope is, is that my blood, if it may not be given directly to a COVID infection, infected patient yet, it might end up in a COVID infection, infected patient who just needs to have blood. So um, I encourage um, anybody who has received the vaccine who might be listening to this phone call, um, it is not a problem according to the american red cross to donate blood obviously with with the age group uh there there is uh what about the follow-up question in regards to um uh, uh, you know if we ever get to you know ages 20 
16 to to whatever age up. Um, is there any medical concerns in relation to this vaccine to um, to pregnancy and, and concerns like that? I mean, I hope we get to the point where we can vaccinate down to that broad range of age and considerations. But just as hmm. Senator Summers brought it up, it was a curiosity point as, as a medical concern in question. Sure. The uh, in, in terms of childbearing women, uh, the, the recommendations are that childbearing women, uh, women of childbearing age, can get it. We don't uh, at this moment in time. There's not a desire to, or, or there's. Uh, I, I think there's there may be some planned trials of giving it to pregnant women. The, the real concern of giving it to women of childbearing age, of course, is if the vaccine could have some effect on. The fetus on the developing uh, uh, baby, and ultimately a child would be born that would have uh, some adverse consequences due to the mother having received the vaccine sort of at the wrong time. Important thing here is uh, because the trials were done uh, sort of expeditiously in the sense that they were done thoroughly, but they were done expeditiously. They didn't try to cover all bases. They didn't try to include pregnant women in it because they didn't want to have that be an issue. Uh, it, it's an issue afterwards because now can you get it? But there wasn't enough data on women of child of women who are actually pregnant while they got it to be able to say for sure the vaccine didn't do anything. Importantly, the vaccines that have had problems uh, that have uh, generated concerns during pregnancy and that sometimes have affected the developing uh, fetus uh, are all live virus vaccines. So a lot of the vaccines that we've had historically have been basically, uh, you take a virus like measles, you take a virus like uh, rubella, uh, which is German measles, you take a virus like chickenpox and a few, which are all living live vaccines. And if you give them to a pregnant woman, there's concern that the, that the babies can become infected and could end up uh, with severe consequences. So those vaccines are not recommended, but vaccines that are basically uh, non-living uh, organisms or a material that is not living can be given to pregnant women. You can get a tetanus shot, you can get uh, a DPT shot, but you can't get, uh, uh, you shouldn't get these others. And so no one, no one seriously thinks that these are going to have any effect on the developing fetus, but until there's more data, uh, they sort of say, uh, Discuss it with your doctor, <laughs> who may or may I, not feel comfortable I, I, I discussing it. Obviously, and because it, it, nobody's it, I concerned. Hope we get right. to that age of get that expansiveness of of vaccination availability that we can have this discussion. Uh, but obviously, I think it's a reiteration that what we did in creating and finding the vaccine is is truly the idea of going to the moon and 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 how remarkable it is. And 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 I do believe in the science of the vaccine, but I, I think it's just important to also reiterate that the vaccine is not a 100% panacea. It has to be in concert with with social distancing, hygiene, and practicing the the, 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 the necessary safety protocols that are, that are important. Uh, but I, I just wanna go back to my fellow state legislators um, and, and make sure that if you have any additional questions that might've popped up, I want to afford you the opportunity to do that because uh, um, it's really important that you represent such a significant portion of your constituency to have your thoughts and voices uh, heard as well. So, Represent Devlin, Behe, McCarthy Behe. And Thank you, Senator. Um, a couple of things. One, I also want to uh, um, emphasize my advocacy for the vaccine. I spent over 20 years in my professional life in the pharmaceutical industry. It happened to be with Pfizer, uh, but these research scientists dedicate their entire lives to finding life-saving cures. And in this case, you know, this is the Super Bowl of all time for a research scientist that, you know, they, um, uh, are so committed to this and I and I do hope I trust I hope I get the opportunity for the vaccine and I will willingly take it. I do want to just go back and reiterate one thing and um, Senator Summers this might be for you. It's something that uh, Rep Leeper also mentioned in terms of you know if you're a smoker and you cut the line. I do want to advocate again for type 1 diabetes. Uh, there is type 2 currently as I understand it per the CDC guidelines, but the state 
is not uh, adhering or does not need to necessarily adhere. There is flexibility. And these individuals have underlying conditions that um, they have no control over. They try to control them with medication, but it's not like they're smoking cigarettes or that they happen to you know, be overweight and have type 2 diabetes, which could have a whole range of things, right? Type 2 diabetes can be incredibly severe, um, or it could be early onset. But type 1 diabetes patients, I just want to make a plug for and hope that we will seriously consider including them within this phase 1B. Um, I can tell you that um, our allocation committee, um, which is comprised of medical doctors, et cetera, um, have looked at this. And um, there are studies, you know, medical studies that show that type 2 has, as I said, a four times greater rate of death conceiving or contracting COVID than type 1 diabetes. And that is why they have made that determination. Um, we can go back and we can advocate. Um, obviously, these uh, decisions are not easy for anybody to make. Um, you know, we have mothers that have children that have cancer that want to get the vaccine. And our issue really is that um, they, um, they have to base their determination on who they believe is at the highest risk. And it's not just one indicator. Like I said, it's smoking and potential imminent death. It's not just smoking. So you can't just take up smoking at 30 and get to the top of the queue. It's not going to work that way. Um, I, my hope is that um, with what we've seen from the federal government, we will be able to receive more vaccine and everyone will be able to get it that wants the vaccine in a much uh, compressed time frame. But until that time, um, the decisions are made by a group and the recommendations to the governor. And ultimately it's the governor and the DPH commissioner who make the final decision on who is included in what category. Um, and they're not easy decisions. So um, I, I will go back and I will reiterate your concerns and make sure they hear them um, and um, you know make sure that is transmitted. But just to let everyone know, none, nobody's making these decisions lightly um, and, and they're not easy. So, um, but again, our big thing is we just need more vaccine. Right. And, um, uh, Representative Leeper and followed by Representative McCarthy Vahey as well. Senator Summers, I really appreciate that framework in approaching how the committee is tiering. Everybody is deserving, but focusing on who we know throughout this pandemic has been suffering the most with hospitalizations and, and highest death rates helps us, I think, frame it for people who are very, very eager um, and been waiting just a long time. It's been a long time. And I, I um, often like to throw in a plug for our teachers because I know that our families and our children have been struggling and suffering at home. Um, but I do really appreciate that framework. And it helps, I think, even for me to, to refocus on um, life is, as a top priority. And also, Rep Devil, and I always appreciate when you make a plug to say, um, that you look forward to getting vaccinated when it's your turn. And I just wanted to join you in that when it is my turn. I am looking forward to getting this, this vaccine. And it really is a, a modern miracle. And like Senator Wong said, putting a man on the moon. And I am just so grateful for all of the brilliant scientific minds who have, have saved us in, in a lot of ways. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. No, absolutely. Representative McCarthy Vahey. Thank you. And I too am going to underscore what Rep. Devlin said. When I am in line and it's my turn, I will be eagerly and gratefully receiving the vaccine. And I think the issue of vaccine hesitancy is one, perhaps that can be our chapter two conversation because we know that the uptake isn't what it needs to be for us to get through this. So we've got the supply issue right now, which hopefully we're going to resolve with some of those other vaccines coming in. But I would just also do another commercial as I did in the beginning. Be persistent and be consistent, folks. And please, please continue to wear your masks and dispose of disposables after one time. Wash them um, if they're washables after you use them one time. Wash your hands and keep the distance. We heard very clearly from our public health department that as these rates go up and um, this new variant, which as we heard earlier, spreads more easily. We're gonna to have to stick with it, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So the more we stick with it, the better off we'll be. 
Thank you so much for all of you. Oh, I appreciate that. And I want to follow up with the comments uh, of my fellow representatives is the fact that I, I do believe in the vaccine and it really is truly a, a scientific uh, uh, accomplishment of, of epic proportions and, and being a co-chair of a bipartisan bioscience caucus. I believe in the science, but I also want to heed and, and, and Dr. Bosino and Dr. Handler, you see that there are people that make a conscious decision for whatever the reason to personally not take it. There are many first responders that I've talked to and others that have made that personal decision. I think it is important um, to note that uh, uh, we do have a, 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 a individual right to make that determination. And, and that is going to be kind of the juxtaposition as well is I think most of the people will believe in the science, but I think also from your background as an epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Hadler, uh, there is a, uh, obviously a conscious consideration that it may not be the end all for every. Because there is a shelf life. And that is one question if you could get to. The second would be, um, there, there's a question that might have been answered by the 211 that if somebody is scheduling an, an, an individual and it, it, these are hard decisions. Well, that's that the, hard to do. Sam. It's hard decisions that the panels are making to decide these things because every decision leaves somebody out. Somebody that, that should be vaccinated. We should all be vaccinated, but they're hard decisions. But we have, you know, at the local level, we have, we are sticking to it. We have turned, uh, you know, at, at all of our clinics, turned people away, some with yelling, some with tears. Uh, and, but, but we're, we're sticking to it because that's, you know, essentially the fairest way we can be is to, to that everybody has the same opportunity to get it uh, and that the experts are making the decisions of who should get it now and we adhere to that. Um, going back to the wastage uh, uh, discussion, so, you know, clinics uh, and most, and I can speak just for ours, we have systems in place to ensure we don't waste a single dose. So we're not wasting a single dose. Uh, so, for example, at today's clinic, I was due for my second shot. Uh, I postponed it because for me to be vaccinated uh, and two other staff uh, who were due for the second dose, we would have had to go to another file and would have had to spend several hours trying to find eligible people from our lists of people that are coming to future clinics to get them to see if they can come early. So we have systems in place. When we have the, those, those doses available, we've turned away a single person to say, hey, can you come back? on our next week's clinic because we don't want to go into another vial. And so, and we've stayed till, you know, seven or eight at night, calling people, trying to get that last dose, that last single dose left, uh, somebody to take it. And so we're, you know, it's, I think all of the clinics are working hard to do that exact same thing to ensure we don't waste a single dose of this vaccine. And there was this another question in there that I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble recalling now. I got two out of three so far. What was the middle one there? Uh, the two one one, uh, you know, somebody had, yeah. There was a report that you can't use the same email yeah. so, to, to apply for certain things. You need to do a unique yeah. one. That may be solved, or, or maybe people don't have access to sure. internet technology. Um, that yeah. two one could be a solution. Yeah. So the, the, the state has had the, both the two one one line, and there's another line on the list on the state website that's for people to call in. That people that don't have the technological ability, uh, and and many other entities, uh, healthcare systems are have those phone lines as well, where they'll, and, and many of them are, are learning just to take people as walk-ins. So the, particularly the email thing is related to those systems that are using the VAM system. Each individual VAMS person requires an individual unique email address. But outside of that, the healthcare systems have the ability to enter people into their electronic medical records uh, programs and to vaccinate them without that. And, and many of them are learning to take walk-ins uh, and to be able to vaccinate those who don't, just don't have the technological capacity. Well, I, 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 it's 8.15. We want to have a hard stop time and respect people's time. But, but I want to extend my appreciation to Senator Summers, uh, Dr. Hadler, and, and Dr. Bosino. Thank you for serving on the panel and, and, and your volunteer work on behalf of so many people and making the tough decisions and being here tonight, uh, giving up your evening. And I want to give extra kudos to my state representative colleagues because the, the important timing of this and, and, and we pulled this together in literally 24 hours. And, and I want to acknowledge my state representatives and, and first elect woman Kupchak and Sands 
for being able to join us tonight, to be able to get this information out to people uh, with literally a day's notice. So um, I, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much. And uh, um, how can they get more information, uh, Senator Summers, in regards to um, sending information to your task force, to the to the commission, or, or to, to, to share some of the stories that we've been getting? I think if you are watching and you are um, curious or need more information, the website is www.ct.gov slash coronavirus. And if you click on coronavirus and you're looking to find out how you sign up, where you sign up, there's a box that says coronavirus vaccine distribution. Click on that and it will lead you to where you go. There's telephone numbers, there's um, how you do it. The other thing you can do is call 211. You can also go to hartfordhealthcare.org. It's very easy to sign up. Yale, um, you can sign up at the Yale site. You can call your local health district. You heard from Mr. Cleary. Um, they are being very flexible in how they intake those who are over 75. Um, the state will, is doing everything they can. If you check that website on, unfortunately, a daily basis, because everything is changing in real time, you will be able to get direction as to where to go, when to go, and how to go. Um, and it'll help calm some of the anxiety. We want to ensure you that you will be able to get the vaccine if you want the vaccine, but you have to be patient. I know it's been hard. It's been a long year. It's coming. We wish it was here now. Um, but again, um, we have to stick by the guidelines. These are really hard decisions, um, 75 and older, 65 and older, and, and there's reasons behind it. Um, I would just like to touch on the fact we have only had one report of vaccine being wasted when a clinician by mistake knocked a vial open onto the floor. Every vaccine is tracked because we cannot have waste at all. So every vaccine is tracked and marked and we know where that vaccine went. Um, if anything, um, as you heard tonight from Mr. Cleary, people are going above and beyond. Many of the hospitals, that's how my husband who's a heart doctor got his, they were doing it in alphabetical order. He's an S, but he signed up on a wait list. He got it after Dr. Boisano. And if there's not somebody who fills the spot, they start calling the wait list. Um, our health districts and our clinical uh, folks who are giving this vaccine, it is treated like the most precious metal that you could ever imagine. So it is not going to waste. And you know how things get exaggerated along the way. Um, well, I want to ensure- Thank you, Senator Summers. Um, I'm going to close by saying, I, I think um, the website is very easy. You can Google CT coronavirus. It'll take you to that site. I'm going to close by, by, by giving my state representative colleagues a final shout out that uh, give your website, your legislative website for the listeners and your constituents should they want to communicate and get you the information because you're the direct pipeline. So let's go back with the order that we did. Representative Devlin, please share with the audience your website, your legislative website to contact you, Jennifer Leeper and McCarthy Behe. Representative right, Thanks, Thanks, Senator. It is very easy, www.repdevlin.com. Uh, you can sign up for newsletters there. We try to keep information available. And I just want to, in closing, thank everybody for the information that you shared tonight. Uh, really, really helpful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Representative Leeper. I had to I had to quickly look it up, Senator Wong. <laughs> Mine is still new, but I have had my um, press aide put all of the helpful links that we could on there. And it is House Dems, D-E-M-S, dot ct dot gov backslash leaper l e e p e r thank you great uh resident mccarthy Behe. so i'm going to follow in the footsteps same uh format as rep leaper mccarthy Behe. but i just would recommend it's easy if you google my name kristen c-r-i-s-t-i-n mccarthy and Behe v as in victor a-h-e-y it'll come up that way great and i'll i'll leave and close by thanking our first select woman who has one of the best newsletters going. So be on the lookout if you wish to get her newsletter. So on that note, I wish everybody a, a safe and healthy day. Um, I, I think this will be one of many updates and we hope to give to people. 
So wishing everybody a, a great night. Thank you very, very much and be safe.